Oh, you know what these are? I'm wearing uh, diffraction glasses. They are scored with thousands and thousands and thousands of tiny uh, little slits on this material. And when the light passes through them, it diffracts out and uh, creates a pattern that kind of looks like a rainbow when it re-interferes with itself later on. And if you wanted this, wait, I'll just, yeah, I'll just show you. Here, check this out. Oh, because. Science! Hello and welcome to another edition of Because Science Footnotes, the companion show to Because Science, where I take all of your comments, questions, and corrections about all the stuff we get up to on this very nerdy channel and give you my snappiest responses. Half, fourth, eighth, sixteenth, thirty-second, sixty-fourth, one hundred twenty-eighth. Ow. My snapping finger. And then I tell you what's coming up next on this channel. Hint, Pika Pika, a Pikachu. It's about Pokemon. But getting right down to it, in the last episode of Because Science, we are trying to figure out, no spoilers, how the Infinity Gauntlet decided your fate. I know that some of you have already seen the movie. If you haven't, we're not going to have any spoilers here. We are just dealing with how in Infinity War, the famous Infinity Gauntlet actually went about doing the dirty dusting deed. I said that it could function as a random number generator, assigning a string of zeros and ones perfectly to all the potential candidates of the snap, and then the Power Stone or what have you will use that data and then dust everyone. Oh, but what did you have to say? First comment comes from Stephen Castle who says, hey Kyle, fun episode. He says, small addendum, you said that the Infinity Gauntlet completed the snap using only two stones, which I believe would be incorrect. My guess, the Mind Stone identifies which beings are capable of being snapped, the Power Stone does the dusting, the Space Stone is extends its power across all the known universe, the Reality Stone makes the effect permanent, the Time Stone is the processing power, and the Soul Stone is a repository for all the dusted souls. Sure. I mean, you're right. Thanos, if he needs all six stones, probably isn't just using two to carry out all of his plan. He's probably using all six for various purposes, but I didn't mention all of them. Chalgris12 says, I think one of the writer's directors in an interview said something that's cleared up what's been affected by the decimation, what they canonically call the snap in the comics, and it's half of all life period, from the simplest organisms to the most complex flora and fauna. Hope no endangered species were lowered below a stable breeding population since it didn't take uh, sexual reproduction into account. And yes, since Infinity War came out, people have been asking this question. You can't just reduce the population of everything by half if you want it to continue existing. There is what's called in biology a minimum viable population size, that if you reduce the population below that size, there's not enough genetic diversity to continue on the species uh, further on in time. So theoretically, there would be many, many, many species on just Earth that would be reduced below their minimum viable population size, and then therefore they would go extinct, which wouldn't be very fair, right? Or at least not in how Thanos made it sound. So you're absolutely right. There would be incredibly complex population dynamics going on, but the movie explanation would be the gauntlet knows all of that and corrected for it. There's an inherent tension between the narrative that you're trying to tell and the science that you want to apply and sometimes one wins out over the other and for a movie a big fun movie like this like that it's fun Paul Piper says, what do you think the dust in the snappening is actually comprised out of? What is really happening when someone gets dusted? Where is all our water going? Is this too many questions? Yes, but you love the show. Now, if I had to guess, looking at Infinity War and other movies, what the dust comprises of, it would be nice if, since Thanos is always talking about the redistribution of resources at cosmic scale, it would be nice if the snap reduced humans to their constituent elements, the things that were born in the guts of stars and exploded out across the cosmos to make the things that are we. If the snapping reduced us just to all of our carbon, to all of our hydrogen, our oxygen, our nitrogen, what happened? have you phosphorus, then you would have to remove all of those bonds that help hold us together and reduce us to various piles of various things. And I guess that might resemble some kind of dust if you removed all of the water or at least broke apart all of the bonds in water such that it would become hydrogen and oxygen to gases uh, in their diatomic form when they're just floating around in our atmosphere. So if I had to guess, since it's acting cosmically, the gauntlet acts to reduce us to our constituent elements. Not 
like some organic compound that is the result of some combustion process or something like that. It turns us back into the carbon from whence we came. In this respect, you could link up a couple different cosmically implicating theories about how the universe really works. You could say, you started as dust and to dust you will return. And half of people did. One Piece Nakama Production says, Kyle, the real question is, are you the true random name generator? Because you always think random people at the end of your video speaking about that, I always wonder when you will start to use foreign names. Good point. I usually like to shout out just a random name at the end of videos, just in case someone happens to be watching, because I like the idea of them freaking out while they weren't really paying attention. But you're right, I do have a cultural blind spot in that I was raised in America and then I was transported to the void, so I know traditionally American names. But you're right, I should start saying more foreign names at the end of my videos, because we want to be cosmic here, not local. Miguel. David Thomas says, I remember in my game design classes that most RNGs, random number generators, use computer systems that are based on the computer's internal clock or something to that nature. Anyways, love the show because science team is amazing. Don't you thank them, thank me. <laughs> I'm just kidding, I can't do anything without them. Seriously, I can't. If they, if they left, I don't know what I would do. So the RNGs that you interact with every day can use little tricks like you learned in your computer design course. Uh, for example, in your computer, as you're saying, it could take the amount of time between different keystrokes, which in theory would be random. The computer doesn't, oh, what did I do? Oh, I sent an email to diesel glasses? What? Do they even make glasses? So the computer takes the amount of time between keystrokes, which would be random because the computer doesn't know what you are going to do, and then it uses that as a seed number to put into an RNG algorithm and then spit out a bunch of random numbers. You're absolutely right. We use little tips and tricks like that to approximate randomness. To get at true randomness, we need a source of it, like we mentioned in the episode, like uh, uh, thermal noise or random radioactive particle emission or yeah. But the nerdiest comment at the time I'm filming this video, I'm giving to Mr. Peterman from Seinfeld, who, who gives an entire step-by-step -step process for how the dusting would actually happen. He, she, they uh, suggest that the gauntlet first sends out a burst of energy across time and space to do like a cosmic census and then assign some random string of digits to them and then also calculate just how much energy the gauntlet would need to input into each person to perfectly dust them, calling them spider O's, you know, to get an O not so good feeling. And then the gauntlet sends out that exact amount of energy through time and space to accomplish the dirty deed. It's a giant comet with a lot of nerdy thought put into it, and for all of that effort, who not nearly an infinite amount, but close. You are indeed, Mr. Peterman, a super nerd. Ha, it's I failed. But of course, I'm not always right. <laughs> Diffraction, what did I get wrong this week? Seriously, 50 cents and you can trip for free. Okay, our first big correction from a lot of you this week all say the same thing. You all point out something that should have been relatively obvious to me, saying that when in Infinity War, Thanos snapped, there was some time delay between how people were being dusted. From our point of view, at least in the movie, some people dusted before other people. There was some kind of time order. And so, all of this snap random number generation would not have to happen as quickly as as I said, all within the time it takes to snap, and rather it could take a few seconds or even a few minutes. You're absolutely right. In the movie, we do see that there is some time delay, which means that if the Infinity Gauntlet is acting as a true random number generator, then it doesn't have to go that quickly, and so it could even more feasibly generate a long string of numbers in that amount of time. That uh, random number generator that we were talking about in the episode from Quintessence Labs can generate a billion random digits every second. So. If Thanos needs 60 billion random digits, that's just one minute, and you can do the math from there. So it gets even closer to feasible, and you're all definitely correct on that. Christopher B. has a correction. Actually, the speed of light is the maximum speed of information. Quantum effects can only happen at the speed of light, so the snap would roll out in a sphere at the speed of light from wherever the snap took place. All right, so a couple of things here, Christopher. You are right that the maximum speed of information that we know of is the speed of light. So if I was to send you, you know, a text message encoded in some kind of electromagnetic wave, the fastest it could get someplace else is at the speed of 
light. Now, as many of you know, quantum stuff can happen with spooky action at a distance. That's what Einstein called it. So for example, if two uh, electrons, which could have either spin up or spin down, just follow me here, two electrons that can have one of two different states are entangled quantum mechanically, you could in theory separate them by many, many light years, measure one, and it has to become one state, and then therefore the other one immediately becomes the other state faster than the speed of light would allow for. So there's actually a distinction here, Christopher. Quantum stuff can happen entanglement-wise at faster than the speed of light. But you are correct in saying that information cannot pass more quickly than the speed of light. So if you were to use quantum entanglement to try to explain faster than light, say, communication, as many sci-fi stories do, it wouldn't actually work. You cannot force a quantum particle into a state to make the other state somewhere else in the universe what you want it to be. That would be uh, communication across that distance faster than light, and there's actually a no communication theorem in quantum physics. So no, information can't travel faster than the speed of light, but quantum effects can. How does the infinity gauntlet make all these things happen in all these different places? I don't know. It's not very clear even watching all of the Avengers movies, so we can't really say. If it was advancing as a sphere out from the point of the snap, it would take thousands and thousands of years just to get outside of our galaxy, let alone affect any of the resulting universe. There could be civilizations outside of the Milky Way galaxy that would rise and fall before the effects of the snap even got to them. So that doesn't really work on the scale of even a Thanos lifetime, even if he has the time stone. So something else like spooky action at a distance is probably going on, or the movie didn't think of it. But that's impossible. <laughs> that's impossible. Sean Smith has a very pedantic correction, saying nitpick Kyle here, but that wasn't an acronym when I started the episode out with I-G-R-N-G and then said acronyms. An acronym is an abbreviation formed from the initial letters of the other words and pronounced as a word. That was just an abbreviation as it doesn't create a pronounceable word. So an acronym would be like laser, which is a pronounceable word from light amplification through the stimulated emission of radiation. That is an acronym, but I-G-R-N-G is just ignoring, ignoring, ignoring. That's pronounceable, right? Yeah, it wasn't an acronym, it was an abbreviation, you win. But the nerdiest correction at the time I'm filming this episode, I gotta give to K1SFD, who says, another great episode, Kyle, whoa! I know you've mentioned it, but I hope everyone realizes that a lot of work for you and the behind the scenes crew goes into these episodes. You know what it costs each week? Everything. Anywho, I wanted to bring up a few small points. One, the probability of a coin landing heads or tails does not equal 100%. Basically going further than what I said is that there are some chances that say the coin upon hitting the table could quantum tunnel through the table or land perfectly on its edge, making the distribution of a perfect 50-50 for heads or tails technically not absolutely correct because some percentage would be taken away from that 100% to have the coin teleport through the table or land on its edge and K1 SFD goes on to say, look, I know I'm nitpicking here, but I have a hard time with absolutes, never 100%. You can have a high probability in gambling, but it's still gambling. Well, technically, you are correct, which is the best kind of correct. And even with that graph of heads and tails probability that we showed in the episode, I said it tends towards 50-50. It's never going to be exactly 50-50 because, as you say, there are all these other variables, millions of other variables that we can't see that affect what is happening. So it cannot be perfectly 50-50. You'd have to have some kind of simulation that dealt with all those other possibilities. So technically, you are correct. And for this very nerdy discussion on how how to flip a coin. Oh wait, like this one. Yep, that's an Avengers Endgame coin. Ooh, correct me on this, but do you have one of those? <laughs> I will flip this coin for every decision going forward, especially if it determines the fate of the universe. I can promise. So congratulations, K1SFD. You are indeed a... Wait. Nope, sorry. Hey man. There was a small probability that would happen. But now, onto this week's episode. It is, how do you make a Mewtwo? That's right, in this week's episode of Because Science, just in time for Detective Pikachu, a movie by Legendary Pictures, which I'm an employee of technically, and you definitely should see more than 
four times, we are trying to figure out just exactly how you would make a Mewtwo, because in Generation 1 and all of the Pokemon stories, Mewtwo is actually a product of genetic science. How could we figure out a real way in our real world today that we could make something like Mewtwo. Is there a way to do it based on all of the Pokemon Pokedexes and media and all that stuff and gene splicing and Mew and we figure it all out. And again, please go watch that movie. Look, you can literally help the show by watching the movie. It's true. But until then, like, comment, subscribe, and go watch the latest episode of Because Science if you haven't yet, all about how the Infinity Gauntlet decides your fate. That's what it was about. And leave me all of your nerdiest comments, corrections, and questions at youtube.com slash because science, facebook.com slash because science, and at because science on Instagram and Twitter. And don't forget, I have run out of nuggets of wisdom to say because I used them all up. Have you ever been that? It's a really weird situation in that I've tried to think of anything more interesting to say and I've run out. So what am I enjoying on, outside the world of science communication? Actually, there's there's something uh, coming up that I'm really excited about, and uh, I, I, you definitely should check it out if you have the chance. Um, a Detective Pikachu.